be here practicing. I mean, they're already ready to go, and we're just beginning to decide. So thank you guys for that. And um, uh, as always, uh, some of those mornings are difficult to call. Uh, safety first. If you're not comfortable being out on the roads by then, by all means, um, stay home, be safe. Uh, it's not always easy making those calls. So uh, thank you, worship team, for your commitment and dedication and leading us in worship. And I, I hope you listen to the words that you're singing and that you realize they are a reality for you and I in Christ. Uh, I was reading a devotional a few months ago, and it kind of, it's one of those that just stuck. And then as we were singing Good, Good Father, I thought it, 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 it kind of went with that. The reality that you and I, we define ourselves usually by what we do. Um, I'm a pastor. You're a farmer. You're an electrician, you're a teacher, uh, maybe um, you're a dad, you know, but, a grandfather. But we, we define ourselves usually by roles that we play. But as believers in Jesus Christ, what a difference it would make as we go into a new year if we defined ourselves as those beloved by God. Because that's what we are. Now, I may happen to be a pastor, and you may happen to be a farmer, but you foremost and above all else, and for all eternity, be, will be one loved by God. If you let that sink in a little bit, it begins to change your thinking as you experience life. And so maybe as you go into the new year, that would be a good thought to define yourself as one beloved by God. Had a good evening last night. Hope you did. We were here. Uh, Trisha Rickus uh, and Walker Shar got married. We were, um, had the wedding here and uh, the reception afterwards, and it was beautiful, and I'm excited for them as a young couple, and it'll be exceeding, exciting to see how God uses them uh, in the years to come. So it was fun to be able to be a part of that as well. Let's pray, and then I want to turn our attention to God's Word. Um, I'm going to have you think a little bit at first. I know that's hard on the first Sunday of a new year, but we can do that. Uh, look at a few passages to make a point, and then I'll get very practical with it. And then we'll celebrate the Lord's table together. So uh, a good time in store as we feed ourselves spiritually. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, again, we, we look to you here at the new year and realize that, that each day is new with you. That you're all about new. Uh, you, you, you love to take that which is old and to redeem it and to make it new. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for the work you've done in my life that you continue to do. Thank you that I'm not the same person I was a year ago and that I can look forward with certain hope and knowing that I will be a different person a year from now. And my prayer for myself and for each one of us is that we would grow and our understanding of just how loved we are by you. That we would grow in our fellowship and our awareness of your presence with us each and every moment of every day. That we would come to understand more fully your purposes for our lives. And Lord, that we would be able to rest and rejoice in that. So guide our time as we come to your word, as we gather as your family around your table. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, it is New Year, and it's time to evaluate, to take stock, and to make resolutions as we look into 2017. I was doing some reading, and based on previous years, some 44% of us, that's a lot of folks, We'll make resolutions this year. But one resolution, when I was looking, what, what, is the, what is the number one resolution that people make? And this year, a surprise came to the top. Usually it's lose weight, eat better, exercise more. But this year, a Marist survey came up with a brand new resolution. One that hasn't made the top ever before. Can you guess what it would be? It's not exercise. It's not eating better. It's not losing weight. What's that? Manage money. That's one, but that's not at the top. I'm sorry? Go to church. I only wish. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
get this. I mean, as a pastor, I find this intriguing because this is never there before. Become a better person. 16%. Weight loss and exercise, 10% each. Spend less, improve health, eat healthier, 7% each. Become a better person. As a pastor that works with people's hearts and lives, I found that amazing. Where did that come from all of a sudden? Maybe we saw how ugly we could be this past year. I don't know. What does it mean as we step into a new year trying to be a better person? And if you're a student of Scripture and you know what Scripture says, we might do some nicer things. We might volunteer a little bit more. But on our own, apart from Christ, uh, we're doomed to fail. If our actions don't deceive us, then our hearts and our minds certainly will. To be a better person. This Advent season, we've been looking at God's redemptive story for mankind. We could say it's, it's God's redemptive story to make us a better person. Something we are incapable of doing in and of ourselves. We looked at Adam and Eve at the very beginning of creation. They're in a perfect environment. They are content. They are fulfilled. Everything they could possibly need or want, God has provided himself for them. And yet they still chose disobedience. And innocence was lost and sin entered into the world. Later, as you read in, our, in Scripture in the Old Testament, God chooses a people for himself through Abraham. Abraham. And he makes a promise to them that he'll make them a great nation, that he'll give them a land, that all the nations of the world will be blessed through them, that he will be their God and they will be his people, not because they were special in any way, but simply because he chose to reveal himself through them. And as we read a little further along in the biblical narrative, we find God revealing himself further to the Jewish people by giving them the law. The law spoke into every aspect of Jewish life. The thought being, surely if God revealed himself to his people, they would respond. I mean, if nothing else, out of thanksgiving for who he is and reverence for that, that they would respond in goodness. There were religious laws that dictated how they worship. I mean, we can move our worship around and we can do a different order of worship and we can incorporate. No, 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 not in the Old Testament. It was very dictated. Even how you sacrificed an animal, the, the steps that you went through in doing that. Step one, step two, step three, step four, and don't mess with it. There were moral laws that dictated how, how the Jewish people were to behave themselves. There were civil and social laws that dictated how not only how they behaved, but how they behaved and interacted with one another. And if you go back and you re read a book like Leviticus, you, you find it covered just about anything imaginable. There were rules and there were laws. 614 different Thou shalls and thou shall nots. All in an attempt to bring forth to express the righteousness of God to his people. Throughout that period of time, and I just found one of the verses in Leviticus 20. Listen to what God says. You shall be holy to me. You shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. You hear what God's saying there? I am your God. I am holy and righteous. You are my people. I expect you to be holy and righteous, to be good. 
The law reveals God's perfect righteous character. It reveals God's expectation upon his people. But there was a problem, wasn't there? The problem is that apart from God, man is not good. Man is not kind. And all of a sudden, the law and all of its righteousness begins to condemn. Like a, like a massive highlighter, it begins to, to expose the sinfulness and the unrighteousness of men in our actions and in our hearts. It wasn't a mistake. The law is good. Hebrews tells us that the, the fault was with us. As people unable to maintain or to perform to perfection. As we read, we find that was part of the purpose of the law as well. To show our need for a Savior. That we are called to a standard that it is impossible for you and I to meet. Think about it for a moment. That was life in the Old Testament. Before Christ. Under the old covenant of law. A perfect standard to achieve, but the inability to come anywhere close to achieving it. Think for a moment. Put yourself under that weight. Under an old covenant law way of living. Every day. Day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year. The same demands, the same failures. How would you feel? What are some adjectives that come to mind? You, what's that? Burdened. Okay, yes, burdened. What else? Futile. Here we go to the temple again to sacrifice another animal. Again. Futile over and over and over. What else? Despair. What am I going to do? I mean, have, you ever, have you ever been, oh, I hated that. When you were in a class and you were just above your head. I mean, you were, you were lost on day two, and you know there's 180 more days in this class, and you are panicked with despair. I don't get trigonometry, and I don't know what I'm going to do because I've got to have this class. Despair sets in, doesn't it? Because there's a standard put before us, and we know I can't get there from here. Impossibility. Frustration, empty, exhausting, draining, hopeless, costly. Do you know how much it costs to bring the very best of your flock and sacrifice it over and over? How do you ever build up a good DNA flock if you're always taking the best of your flock and sacrificing it? It was expensive. But then God did something wonderful, didn't he? We call it Christmas. There are those Christmas verses throughout Scripture. One this morning from Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born of under this old covenant law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Did you catch that? It's an incredible verse. Jesus was born, yes, and we rightfully celebrate it, but he was born, what? So that he might die. That he could bring to fruition, that he could bring to an end the old covenant of law and establish a new covenant, a covenant of grace. 
A new covenant where God himself does within us what we cannot do on our own. And brings us into a relationship with himself. His life, his death. First, he died to fulfill the old covenant of the law. In Matthew 5, he says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. Remember, the law was good. There's nothing wrong with the law. It was wrong with those of us trying to keep this law. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is the only man who ever lived and fulfilled the law perfectly in all of its righteousness. He's the only one that ever could because he was God God himself. The law is good, but it's powerless to save or to make good. The law demands performance and perfection, but with no power. I mean, it would be like When I was in seminary, the seminary wasn't located in the best area of town in Dallas, but if you walked a mile up, there was Swiss Avenue. If y'all are from anybody's from Dallas, you've heard about Swiss Avenue. Beautiful mansions on that street. So on Christmas Day, sometime on the afternoon, Marley and I would go up and walk Swiss Avenue to see how many people got new cars for Christmas. They'd park them in the driveway and put huge bows on top of them. I was like, this is really weird, but it was fun to watch anyway. So this morning, imagine with me, you got up and and, and your wife, guys, had bought you a brand new charcoal black viper with a big red bow on top sitting in your driveway. And you run out the door and it, for me, all yours, honey. Oh, you're the best wife ever. And you're looking at it and you're checking it out and it shines and it's beautiful. And it's like, I'm driving it to church this morning. And you jump in the car and you turn the key and nothing happens. Nothing. So you try it again, and you try it several times. It doesn't even turn over. You're like, I'm doing something wrong. It's new technology, and you get out the manual, and you read. It should work. Probably doesn't turn a key. You probably just touch it, right? <laughs> it's hard to keep up. But anyway, it doesn't start. You pop the hood, and you go around, and you look inside, and it's empty. You've got this beautiful viper, but there's no engine. There's no power inside. That was the law. It was was this beautiful, righteous car. Perfect, but no power to deliver. Absolutely void. And Jesus came as one born under the law kept the law perfectly, and fulfilled it completely on our behalf. He died and marked the end of the law. Now, a couple of passages I want us to look at, because that leads us to our second point. He died to end the old covenant of law, but he also died to establish the new covenant of grace. Take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We'll look at these quickly, but I want to make you aware of them here. And you'll have to think a little bit with me. I've learned, I've, I've come to appreciate Hebrews. Sometime I, we've got to go through Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is the Jewish Romans for us, okay? Uh, it's written to a Jewish audience, and, and the author is trying to help them see this better way, this good news, this, this freedom that comes from stepping out from under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant of Law, and experiencing this new covenant of grace. But it was so hard for these Jewish people who had spent their lives, they had tradition built on being good on making New Year's resolutions of being better, but coming up short time and time and time again. And and, and the author's saying, but guys, after 2,000 years, there's good news here. There's a new covenant. Hebrews 9, verse 15. Therefore he, Jesus, is the mediator of what? A new covenant. Something new is going on, folks. Not the same old game that we've been playing for 2,000 years. Something new. He is the mediator of a new covenant. 
We call it a new testament or a new covenant of grace. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Since a death, Jesus' death, has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Remember the first covenant just showed me how sinful I was. Thou shalt not steal. Oh crap, I just stole. I'm a sinner. I'm a thief. It has redeemed us from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And then he says, for where a will is involved, a will, like when you die, there is a will. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. Uh, A will is not enacted until someone dies. Someone dies, they are pronounced dead. A few weeks later, there is a reading of the will and testimony of that person. And so it says, where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established, for a will takes effect only at death. So when does this new covenant of grace take effect? At Jesus' birth or at his death? Which is it? His death. Only takes effect at his death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. There's a lot we could say on that. There's a lot that goes into interpreting what Jesus teaches in the Gospels as one who was born under the law. We have to be careful because the New Testament of the New Covenant of Grace comes in with his death. Jesus came and died. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, the Old Covenant of the law, and he instituted a new covenant of grace. Turn over a few pages more, because Paul is hitting this point with his Jewish brothers over and over and over again. Hebrews 10.8. It's a little bit of an awkward verse. He's quoting from the Old Testament, and Jesus is speaking in here. The writer is referring to what Jesus has spoken here as well. He says, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he, had, then he added, Jesus saying, Behold, I have come to do your will. He, Jesus, does away with the first, the old covenant of law, in order to establish the second, the new covenant of grace. And by that will, that covenant, get this, The old is past, the new has come. By this new covenant of grace, we have been sanctified. Not we will be. Not we could be made new. We have been made new. Set apart, made holy, acceptable to God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ Once and for all. Do you get it? Do you see why Jesus could utter those words from the cross? It is finished. It's done. I have fulfilled the the Old Testament law and the condemnation that was there. And I have brought life and freedom and grace and redemption to mankind. One more passage. You have to back up for this one. Hebrews 7 Verse 18, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside, the old covenant of the law, because of its weakness and uselessness. It's, it's, It's useless to bring about righteousness. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced, through which, and I chose this verse because here's the point, folks, through which we draw near to God. We draw near to God. And that's what I wanted us to see as we work through that that story of redemption as it's told through Scripture through Advent, was the whole purpose. Yes, there's the forgiveness of sin, and that is awesome. 
But that is just the necessary prerequisite to being brought into relationship with God. A, a way has been made possible. And it's outside of ourselves. The law proved that we can't be good enough. Sin always stood in the way. Sacrifices always had to be made. But now, Jesus died fulfilling the law and ushering in a new covenant. A covenant of grace where God makes us righteous. God makes us holy. He gives us that new spirit inside. Instead of telling us to be good and be holy, as he did the Israelites there in Leviticus, he has made us good. He has made us holy. He has given to us a new spirit, a spirit alive to God that desires to, to love and to serve God. We don't need under the new covenant to resolve to be better people. We have been made better. We have been made complete. As new creations, we are alive to God, pleasing and acceptable unto Him, empowered by Him, with the ability to say no to the sinful flesh. We are gifted by Him. We have a truth, a good news message to proclaim to others. And we are eternally secure in him. You see it? And this becomes important. Why? Because it is God who is working in us. But my fear in most of the churches in our land is though we may not technically go under Jewish law, we choose to live under what I call religious law. And we're really no better off than the Jews were under the old covenant of law. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, I can look at my own life. Growing up, my dad had a Methodist background. My mom had an incredibly strict Southern Baptist background. And so, spiritually speaking, mom ruled the ruse. She ruled it in some other ways as well, but definitely spiritually speaking. So growing up, I learned very quickly how to perform religiously. Um, it wasn't a matter of, are we going to church in the morning? You went to church in the morning. If you were sick, you just did what you had to do and you went to church. It didn't matter. If it was one of those crazy days and it snowed a foot of snow in Charlotte, I don't know, Dad put the kids out in front of the car, shoveled your way through. You went to church on Sunday morning. You went out to eat lunch, and then you went to church Sunday evening. You went to church Wednesday night. I could probably list on two hands the number of times we missed in 18 years. You just didn't miss because godly people go to church always. And if you happen to be out of town, you bring a bulletin from the church that you attended wherever you were. That's just the way it was. Now, I'm not making fun of church attendance. If the purpose was to be at church, to, to worship, and to be a part of a family, that's awesome. But that wasn't the purpose of being in church when it was that regulated. It was because I didn't want to look bad. My mom didn't want to look bad to her friends. She didn't want to look at, come across as less spiritual. Your kids have to be perfect. It's kind of humorous. I ended up in ministry, and boy, was I not perfect. I had this bad habit on every Sunday morning, it seemed like. I got sleepy. We had the old wooden pews. And I still do this. Marlene last time, you know, sometimes when you fall asleep, you twitch. I don't twitch. I kick Marlene out of the bed still. It's a whamming kick. So I'm sitting in the pew... And you sit up close to the front, because spiritual people sit to the front. You didn't know that, okay? <laughs> you're really spiritual when you're the front. We're, we're working on it. We still got a row open. I would doze off, and mom would put her hand around me, and she had this point here that she would pinch. 
and, and would send a sharp pain down your neck and down your leg. But sometimes she didn't realize I was not off. And I would have one of those jerks. And every time I'd haul off and I'd kick the pew in front of me and the whole bit, boom. <laughs> and you know, when you get this death look from mom, the Darth Vader look, and you knew it may be heavenly in church, but when you got home, there was going to be hell to pay. <laughs> Not because I had just fallen asleep, but because I'd embarrassed mom. It, religious people's children don't fall asleep in church. They listen. And they take notes. And pretty soon I learned that. And so I had my Bible open and I was highlighting, marking it through junior high and high school. I had my notebook and I was taking notes. I learned very quickly how to play this game. I learned how to dress. You wore a tie. Well, at six, it was a bow tie. But later, it was a tie and a suit. And you got a new one at Easter and you wore it all that year. Then you got another new one. You wore it all that year. And then that was just what you did. You dare not show up at church in jeans and tennis shoes. What are you thinking? You getting the picture? All these unspoken rules we put ourselves under. Drinking? Oh my goodness. Never! I mean, we went to Florida, did a timeshare thing. They used to be really cool. You could go for a whole week and stay if you just put up with the morning spill. And we go in the room, and, and we walk in this beautiful hotel room, and there's this big bottle of champagne on ice. You would have think, you would have thought it was a bottle of the plague. Everybody, mom, dad, all of us, we kind of just walked around. What is that in our room? We don't have that. Somewhere, mom kind of slid it in her suitcase and hid it so we didn't have to look at it. We go home. It never made it in the house. No, it went into the storage room. I watched up there on the shelf for a couple weeks, and all of a sudden it disappeared. I have no clue what happened to that bottle, but it never saw the light of day in our house. Because Christians would never have a glass of champagne on New Year's Eve, would they? Never. Play cards? Who are you talking to? Are you kidding? And then I go on to school, and Mike and I, Joy and I have laughed about this. You know, you go to school, and... It really is kind of funny. I love Moody. It's a great school, and they've grown up too. I forget what it was. The skirts, ladies, three, no, two and a half inches below the knee. I mean, get the ruler out, you know. Oh, you're bending up. Let me stand a little straighter. Two and a half inches below the knee, always skirts, no pants. Guys, slacks, shirt. The worst was seminary, though. I go to Dallas, and we get down there. We had to wear coat and tie. So I go to, every day we go to Dallas, and we're all in, because we're all broke, we're in these polyester blue jackets with khaki pants. People going by thought we were a modeling studio. They just didn't look at our faces close enough. But it, it was just weird. It's what you, polyester blue and khaki, it's, it's religious, it's spiritual. It, it makes you more spiritual. All these rules, all these expectations not necessarily bad in and of themselves, but more often than they're not, they're, they're, to pro, they're, they're projecting a sense of spirituality that I have and you don't. I mean, I've, I've heard parents, I'm so embarrassed when my kids act up in church. I'm like, they're kids. It's okay. Doesn't bother me. A kid's allowed a bad day. It's all right. Doesn't make you a bad parent. Kids are kids. They're going to do what they do. You getting the picture? In Christ, because of grace, we are free. Now, Paul in Corinthians talks about that. You don't want to violate your own conscience. If, if, if drinking is a problem for you, then don't drink. If drinking causes a weaker brother to stumble, don't drink. There was champagne at the wedding last night. I easily could have had champagne. It would not have bothered me personally. But I know that there may have been those there who see me in a role as a pastor. And that would have been a problem for them. So I gave up that freedom. 
doesn't mean the freedom wasn't there. It just means I chose not to exercise it. It had nothing to do with spirituality. Molly was in the hospital. One night they tried to serve something kind of a tater tot hot dish concoction. And I just told Marlene, I'll go get something. So I went to Firehouse Subs, and I'm waiting for our sandwiches to be made. And these three guys come in, and immediately I knew they're either Mormon or they're Christian. I could tell by their haircut. I could tell what they were wearing. And I just kind of watched a little bit amused. And sure enough, they're from a well-known Christian college. I saw it on one of their jackets once they sat down, and I just chuckled. See, we never think of a Christian having long hair and tattoos, do we? Body piercings? Oh, no, never. That's not spiritual. I love the little thing going on Facebook. Should a Christian go to a gay friend's wedding? Well, I don't know about you, but why not? I don't agree with the lifestyle. It's just as sinful as overeating, going to Burger King four times a week, and stuffing yourself with a Big Mac. But who's going to be light to them if we're not? Who's going to love them if you don't? And I hear these Christian parents that maybe have a, have a, have a homosexual daughter or son, and they just totally cut them off. Don't want anything to do with you. You're not my son anymore. I'm like, how can you do that? Okay. They're lost. They're trying to figure life out. But if I don't love them as their father, who will? Folks, we've been freed from all that silliness. We have been made righteous in Christ. And as I mentioned, there's some balances to all this, yes. But we need to rejoice. We need to breathe. We need to be the body of Christ that's loving a people that is dying and going to hell. And do they do crazy, bizarre, stupid things? You bet they do. But they're just trying to fill the hurt and fill the void. And do we as believers sometimes get deceived and do stupid and crazy things? Yeah, we do. And we need to be able to forgive and to encourage, and to build up. Because as I said at the beginning, we are a people beloved by God. It's not based on performance and religious rules. It's based on His righteousness and what He's done for us. And that's what we celebrate at the table this morning. So I'm going to invite the gentlemen that are going to help us with the elements if they come forward. This is the Lord's table. It is a celebration of all that he has done for us. The fact that we can rest. We don't have to be good enough. He was good enough for us. That we can celebrate in who we are in Christ. The new life that we have in him. If you're visiting with us and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're welcome to be a part of this table. Uh, Children, as long as they understand the basics of the gospel message and have made that decision, they too are welcome to participate. Jesse, would you pray for the bread, please?
we were singing at the beginning of the service, and it comes from Romans 8. We looked at that a year ago, but listen to these words again. Let them sink in. Let them, let them be a reality into your heart, not just verbiage. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you sense the freedom that that statement brings? For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. He has made us holy. He has made us complete. Eat this in remembrance of him. And Rick, would you mind praying for the cup for us? Amen. verse to think think on while the cup is being passed. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ died for sins once and for all. He doesn't continually die for our sin. He has died for our sins. The righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Amen. Union is definitely reflective, but I like looking out and seeing smiles uh, as some of you are thinking through what it is Christ has done for you. And that should make us smile. It should bring joy. Do this in remembrance of him. They'll bring the baskets up, so you've got something to do with the cups here. And then this is also the first Sunday of the month and of a new year and all that good stuff. And uh, on the first Sunday of the month, we like to take a benevolence offering, which we use to meet some of the emergency needs that come up within the church family and at times within the community as well. And so it's, you can just let those go by themselves maybe and go ahead and bring the plates back up. There we go.
thank you for your generosity. Uh, it, it, it truly is amazing, as I was reflecting over this year, how God has used us as a church family in the lives of so many and given us that opportunity, so thank you for that. Then Terry, would you take Greg's place? And Greg, I think, wants to embarrass Mike and I. Is that right? Oh, Jesse's going to, oh, here he is. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. So it's been a couple of weeks now. You guys haven't noticed. Sundays haven't been the greatest day for weather. But um, we got a Christmas gift for Mike and Ray. And uh, it's from the congregation. So thank you guys for being our pastors and everything that you do for us. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to grow alongside of you. Um, I, I, I marvel at that, and thank you for allowing me to grow in my role as a pastor with you and for being a part of God's kingdom work, and I look forward to how God is going to work in this coming year for sure. Would you stand? I'll give us our benediction and wish you the very best in this coming new year. Lord Jesus, again, we look to you. And my prayer for this new year is that as a church family, we would understand ourselves as beloved by God. That we would go more deeply in our understanding of exactly what was accomplished for us through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. And from that amazing position of being in Christ, of being secure, of being loved, of being free. That, Lord, you might use us to impact this community with this incredibly good news in this coming year. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you and Happy New Year. Desperation When all we know Is doubt and 